Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. This is the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre, and tries to find an answer. And this week, Caroline, I have a doozy for you. I'm excited. Carrie, I'm going to start with what's going to seem like a silly question for you here. <laughs> like every day of my life, Sean. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what, what's today's date? Let's, let's keep it a little timeless for our listeners who won't hear this for a few oh, days. okay. Um, what, what year is it? <laughs> well, Robin Williams and Jumanji, it is 2021. Interesting, Caroline. Interesting. I was hoping you weren't one of the sheeple. No? Huh? No, I'm sorry to tell you, you've been living a lie. Oh? That's right. I was once like you, but I've come around to the truth that we are, in fact, living in the year 1724. Pardon? 297 extra phantom years having been invented in history. So we're really in the 1700s? Uh, that is the premise of oh. the Phantom Dark Ages theory. So this isn't necessarily a fact. It's a theory. Oh, facts are going to be... Facts are going to be hard to come by for the first <laughs> half of this podcast. Oh, my favorite kind. I have been reading treatises and academic papers that honestly make my head spin. Wow. There's a very similar thing to reading the work of somebody. Uh, my little sister is a PhD biomedical engineer. And, uh, and we do this. <laughs> uh, and reading her trying to read her papers you know her published work my, my head spins it's all about um modeling heart cells and and things and, and uh, the language gets away from me pretty quickly it's similar <laughs> when you're reading the work of not a genius but an insane clown posse yeah an, an insane clown <laughs> posse or just a maniac um writing something that i don't know i i feel like the original proof of some of this stuff was probably written in bodily fluids Ew. Sean, maybe it's just too deep for you to understand with your little baby mind. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. But I do encourage anyone to start dipping their toe into the phantom time hypothesis and the phantom dark ages if they want to, I don't know, get actively dumber from reading a thing. It seems counterintuitive. Well, let's not, you know, make a judgment before we even go through this thing. Let's dip these toes in. What's the Phantom Dark Age? Okay. Why are we in the 1700s? Why am I living a lie? 1724, to be exact. This idea was first proposed by a German academic named Heribert Illig. <laughs> Heribert? Yeah, kind of like Herbert, but with an extra eye just stuck right in the middle. Heribert. Huh. Illig. Um, I assume, I'm going to assume that's just a German version of Herbert. Sure. But Heribert, in any case, Illig wrote a, a paper about this for the first time in 1991. Now, Illig was born in 1947, and he was pretty active in a couple different German societies. Um, don't give me that look. <laughs> Not those mid-century German societies. <laughs> well, you know, just got to clear things up. A pretty popular idea in Germany in the post-war mid-century uh, was the idea of historical reconstruction. Yeah, I could see why that would be appealing to them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but not just, oh, these things happened, these things didn't happen. There was some of that happening in Germany right after the war. Oh. Uh, and it's it continues to this day, unfortunately. But um, that kind of sparked ideas of where people were like, w well, if that was fake, uh, what what if the whole thing was fake? Oh, my Lederhosen, I. Um, so Illig was a big subscriber of a man named Emanuel Velikovsky, who was an earlier... Um, Russian academic historian, I'm using historian with some pretty, pretty big air quotes here, who, Tragy. well, Velikovsky kicked off this whole kind of manner of thinking and inspired uh, uh, many people to try to construct their own timelines and their own uh, uh, understandings of history and prehistory. Uh, what Velikovsky did was he was looking to disprove a book that Sigmund Freud had written at the time about uh, Moses and Akhenaten. It's actually a whole interesting thing. We've talked about, Freud? we mentioned, yeah, we mentioned Akhenaten, of course, on our King Tut episode. Absolutely. Uh, that would be Tut's father. 
uh, Freud suggested that uh, Moses may have been a, a, a native Egyptian born during Akhenaten's time, uh, who got all of the monotheist, monotheistic ideas from the state religion at the time in, in Egypt. It's probably not true, but anyway, th- that doesn't matter. It is interesting. It is. Uh, Velikovsky was just trying to disprove that and show that the account in the Bible was, was the right way of things. And so he was looking for accounts of the biblical plagues in Egyptian writing. He found something that sort of looked like it, but it was 250 years before the accepted date for the Exodus. And so instead of going, oh, that must have been a different thing, (laughs) Velikovsky decided, oh, obviously we have a misunderstanding. Um, The Exodus happened 250 years earlier than we thought it did. So then he started making up uh, a new timeline based on um, sort of global disasters or things that seemed like global disasters that different cultures had mentioned and trying to line those things up. So he did find other things that lined up with the idea that time was 250 years earlier than he thought it had been. Yeah, but like no other serious historian ever took this guy all that seriously like from the 50s to the 70s he was basically not allowed on college campuses that's what happens to pioneers he got different ideas about different things so uh who knows how much of that i'll even cut out the point is there was this idea because we're not talking about velikovsky today we're talking about herbert illig but illig was a fan of this idea of a new understanding of the timeline of history of, of where the time times of things ended up and of questioning the, um, you know, conventional wisdom of when things happened Mm -hmm. and how long ago. So he published, um, several attempts at reordering prehistory and ancient history and didn't get much traction, although he was published in a few, um, German journals around the time. And finally, in 1991, he got international attention when he published on his Phantom Time Hypothesis. Ooh. This states that somewhere in history, between the year 0 AD and now, 300 years or so of time were skipped or invented. The clock was moved ahead 300 years on the calendar, and 300 years of fake history were inserted somewhere. Well, Sean, my next questions are, why did he think this? And how could you possibly accomplish something like that? Uh, Well, I haven't been able to find any of Illig's original work translated into English, so we Mm. can't have this from his mouth. But we have an independently published paper by a man named Hans Ulrich Niemitz from 1995. In this paper, he claims to be a um, sort of a a co-worker of Illig's, a, what do you call them, a contemporary and... Um, collaborator, Mm -hmm. and someone who also worked on this Phantom Time issue. And he quotes from it quite a bit in in his paper. So, what does Nemitz say about the Phantom Time? He says that you can pin this theory basically on a couple of main things. The first is a total lack of archaeological evidence that can be reliably dated to between the years 600 and 900 AD. Really? It's true. And I'll get more into it in a second. Um, the second is architecture doesn't seem to follow uh, the pattern. There's there's like a, about a 300 year gap, again, between 600 and 900 AD in European architecture where things don't seem to change very much. And in fact, maybe nothing seems to have been built. And finally, a mathematic. this was all kicked off by a mathematical quirk that Illig noticed, Illig and his friends, with the time shift from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Gregorian calendar is the calendar that was introduced by the Catholic church in 1582 to adjust for some astronomical problems with the, the Roman calendar. I'll explain that in a moment too. Can't wait. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with the total lack of archeological evidence. Now, again, uh, this is a paper from all from a paper by Hans Ulrich Niemitz. This was first written in 95, but it was revised in 1997. It was revised again in 2000 and today... It still has a couple of typos. (laughs) Okay. So, Nemitz, first of all, points out that the only way to reliably and exactingly date something to as long ago as 600 to 900 AD, the things we, the things that archaeologists rely on the most for scientific dating, for for sort of objective dating, Mm -hmm. is... For carbon dating. Is dendrochronology... 
and radiocarbon dating. Mm-hmm. And dendrochronology, I didn't actually know this, is actually used to calibrate radiocarbon dating. Okay. Uh, so you'll use a tree that you can tell its age from its rings, right? And mm-hmm. and you'll carbon date that so you can get a sense for. Um, and they can tell stuff in, in tree rings and even in carbon dating that has to do with like, oh, this was around the time that a volcano happened like across the world and stuff. And they date it that way, right? It's crazy. Yeah. The, the cool thing about dendrochronology is trees especially in a certain area but even globally for really big events Mm -hmm. uh, like that volcano you mentioned or you know a global period of cooling Mm -hmm. Uh, but trees certainly within a um a certain area a certain habitat will all share certain growth patterns like oh this was a big summer so there are a couple big summers so there were bigger rings in the trees here then they got smaller for a couple years than this you can recognize that pattern across all of the trees that grew at that time in that region, or most of them. Mm-hmm. And that means you don't need a full tree to tell how old the piece of wood is. If you have a timber or something, you can recognize the patterns of, oh, that's the pattern from this time. So we know this tree was alive then. It's or wild. this tree was cut down then. <laughs> but Illig argued that, uh, A, each tree is different, and some have missing rings sometimes, and sap can create uh, uh, phantom rings, and uh, it's just unreliable. You need a bunch of trees in an area to establish those patterns. Uh, He says 50 is a good dating sample, and there's only three good full-to-the-edge tree samples from uh, the area of Constantinople in 380 AD. Yeah, of course. Um, The human race are monsters, and we've cut down everything old and ancient like that, except for, I guess, three trees? According to Illig, or at least three trees that are good samples for dating that region at that time. Those are like ancient beings. They are, yeah. (laughs) Uh, well, no, I think these are samples because these are samples because they've already been cut down for the purpose of dating the area. Whatever. Leave the trees alone. Illig went on to say that since radiocarbon dating is, like I said, calibrated in part using dendrochronology, since he had thrown out dendrochronology's reliability, he had to throw out radiocarbon too. None of this means anything, he said. Okay. (laughs) And so without that, he said, what what can we rely on to, to date these things and to create a chronology? And he thought that The historians working on medieval Europe were relying far too much on written sources. But he must have had a reason to think those specific years were missing. Because he's not saying that 100, year zero, I guess, to 500. Like, there's stuff that he can find from there, archaeologically, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you think those specific years were missing? The ones between 600 and 900. Well, it's interesting. The first thing Illig noticed was this math problem. So let me get to that first. Can't wait. (laughs) The Julian versus the Gregorian calendar. And for this, we have to go back a ways. We have to go back to 45 BC. All right. We're in the BC times. Uh Uh-huh. When Julius Caesar uh, noticed some problems with the Roman calendar. Mm Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of interesting. The Roman calendar was a disaster. It was 12 months uh, long, like ours, uh, but it was 355 days. Nope. That's incorrect. <laughs> and, and they knew that it wasn't quite the right number of days, but it's, it's sort of like we have a leap year. What they would have is a an intercalary month between February and March that they would only do every other year. Like a baby month? Yeah, like a little mini month between what? February and March every other year. What it was, was it called? The intercalary month. Well, that's not fun. And the worst part about this was the length of the intercalary month wasn't prescribed by a formula or by a law or something. It was appointed by the priests, who at the time were a political appointment. This is like when my mom is trying to tell me a recipe, and she's like, just throw in like a bunch of salt. I'm like, well, is it a a tablespoon or is it a handful of salt? Because that makes a big difference. Yeah, but now imagine that it's her, your mom saying, throw in some salt and throw in some pepper, and the pepper is the same political party as you. Uh, because if you were... <laughs> I think we're mixing metaphors here. A little bit, but it, it, the Roman uh, priests, the pontifex, were 
political appointees and they were with the political parties. So remember that the consuls and the the consuls would serve for a year, right? The guys in top charge, you'd always have two consuls at the top of the Roman system. And if one of those consuls was one of your buddies, maybe you would make the year a little bit longer in like that by intercalary days? month. Yeah, but sometimes by a lot of days. And so... <laughs> Stupid. And sometimes if your friend was in there, maybe you say, you know what? We need an intercalary month this year, even though we had one last year. Or if the consoles for the year are people who you don't care for, maybe you go, you know what? We already did an intercalary month two years ago. We don't need one this time. We're going to skip it. This is going to be a short year. It's okay. This is completely absurd. Yeah, no. So this is Caesar saw a problem with this, and this is why he took over Rome. <laughs> Well, among other things. So in order to fix this, he actually first added two months to the year 708, which is the year that they were in by their counting. Okay. Uh, made it f a 445 day long year. That sounds like 2020, am I right? But that was to get them to roughly the, roughly to the winter solstice. Okay. Because that's where they felt that the year should start. Yeah, and so what Julius Caesar did was um, what we're familiar with now. He he had his mathematicians. They, the Romans were really smart. They weren't just shooting from the hip here. Well, until they did this. <laughs> well, yeah, but, we'll throw in a few days, throw in a few weeks. Who cares? But they understood. This is the amazing thing, right? When it was done right, the 355-day years would alternate with 377 or 378-day years, which evens out to about a 366-day year, mm -hmm. which is pretty close to what the solar year is. It's not right on, though, which is why you need leap years and stuff. Right. So Caesar had his mathematicians and his astronomers figure this out. And the best they could come up with was that there should be about 365 and a quarter days per year. And so that meant, instead of leaving this up to some political appointee or something, you just add an extra day in the middle of February every four years, once every four years. And it was in the middle. They would add it uh, until pretty recently on the in history, actually. They would add the leap day. On, oh, was it like 12.5? It was the second 24. You'd go there were two days called 24? Yeah, you go February 24, February 24, February 25. Why? I don't know. <laughs> 24A, 24B. Kinda. That's stupid. <laughs> it is real dumb. So this was working great until, um, this was working great until in the 1500s they noticed that Easter wasn't really near the vernal equinox, the spring equinox anymore. Well, Sean, why would that matter if they weren't just co-opting a pagan holiday for the vernal equinox? Oh, Carrie, they were co-opting a pagan holiday, but oh. more importantly, church doctrine had specifically tied Easter to the date of the equinox as set by the Julian calendar. And unfortunately, that meant that the church's law was now out of whack with the natural law since it wasn't in line with the actual equinox. Sure. And then all of this was... Again, based on pagan holidays that had nothing to do with Jesus. So here's what they figured out. There aren't exactly 365 and a quarter days in a year. Actually, 365 and a quarter days is 11 minutes longer than a solar year. Okay. And so they fixed this. The Gregorian calendar is exactly the same as the Julian calendar. Except every 400 years, you skip one leap day. This was all figured... Do we still do this? Yeah. I mean, it hasn't been... It's been 400 years since this point, right? When, would, when did we have our leap day? The rule is if a year is divisible by 100 and not divisible by 400, the leap year is skipped. Oh, the year 2000 was a leap year, but 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years. Interesting. The next time a leap year will be skipped is the year 2100. Oh, well, definitely be alive for that. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. <laughs> okay, so are you following all this so far? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Good. 
Yeah, so Pope Gregory, uh, the, let's see, X-I-I-I, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth was the guy in charge in Rome when they noticed this and finally uh, uh, got the job done. I think they had actually told the Pope before the Council of the Vatican was like, you fix the calendar. And he was like, uh, the, next the next guy, guy can get it. Yeah, so Gregory <laughs> uh, is the one who inherited this job, but uh, he got to slap his name on the calendar, so pretty cool. Um, his astronomers and math heads... Um, did all this math and they uh, decided they were going to adjust the calendar by 10 days to bring it back in line with the actual spring equinox. And then do the other stuff going forward. And then going forward, they would skip one leap year every 400 years. <laughs> Those guys could deal with that. Now, this is the first red flag for Illig. And it might be the first red flag for you too, Caroline, depending on how fast you can do this mental math. Um... I can assure you that it is not fast. Remember, we're getting 11 extra minutes on every year, right? Mm-hmm. And Illig calculated that that would mean by 1582, from the start of Caesar's calendar, 13 days of drift. Mm-hmm. By Illig's estimation, it only would have taken 1,257 years to get to 10 days of drift. From the Julian calendar, from, from the when Ju they fixed it. Yes. So, okay. So here's Pope Gregory in 1582 saying, hey, we fixed it. We fixed the drift by 10 days. Mm -hmm. Illig says, whoa, what about those other three days? Mm -hmm. What about him? Well, what about him? I don't know. They're throwing days left and right. They're taking days. They're putting in days. There's a, a baby month. There's a leap day. I don't know. To Illig, this suggested if the church only fixed the calendar by 10 days, and that only accounted for 1,257 years of drift, there were 325 years that just weren't accounted for in history. And what's more, the Catholic Church must have known this. So he is positing that because there's three missing days from when they fixed it, mm -hmm. that would total 325 years between when the Julian calendar was fixed and when the Gregorian calendar was put into place. Mm -hmm. there's, there... missing, there's a missing amount of time that the church knows about, question mark, but no one else does. Yeah, you get about one day of drift every century with that Julian calendar, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so if there was only 10 days of uh, of drift, that seemed seemed crazy to Mr. Illig. Well, you would think that he would want to make it 13 days even anyway, because um, he's the 13th Gregory. So it's kind of like, yeah, I'm number 13, man. Well, that's true. But the whole point of this was to get it right. And, sure. And keep it right. Well, no, because if it was 13, you would imagine that he would have wanted to keep it 13 oh, and I not see. 10. Yes, well, right, but the issue here is that they were trying to cover up the fact that there was this extra time added to history. Okay, why did they cover it up? And wouldn't the people at the time have been like, wait, why is it this year when it should be this year? Like, when they switched... Like, isn't it like they went to bed one day and it's year, I don't know, 6.30, and then they wake up and it's year 9.30 or whatever? Uh, we'll get into the who's, what's, and wherefores in a, in a little a little bit, Carrie. But first, I just want to... Who? Wanna... What? Wherefore? First, Illig noticed this math, right? You've got 325 missing years. And so Hill Illig and his boys... B-O-I-S? B-O-I-Z. <laughs> started looking for places where there were gaps in written history. Okay. Places where maybe a subject was left off for, say, about 300 years. Mm -hmm. And here's what they found. There is no mention of any building in Constantinople, the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, from 558 to 908 AD. No mention anywhere in recorded anything? Of things being built in Constantinople. Well, that's weird. Uh, there's no real evolution of the doctrine of Catholic faith from 600 to 1100? Until today, am I right? They just didn't really, um, like, once you got to the early. They landed on Jesus and they were like, tight, we're going to keep this. 
well, yeah. like this. And once you got to like the 12th century, all of a sudden there was all of this thought coming out about purgatory and uh, 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 sin and all this stuff. And, and that stuff just, you know, where was it here? You know, there was yeah. just, there's just a 500 year period where no one seems to say anything about evolving, you know, Catholic <laughs> and, thought. And you know, those Catholics, they really play it close to the chest. Uh, farming. Um, all of a sudden... At about the year 1000, you see uh, three acre farm systems and horses with plows just pop into existence. Um, but they don't appear in the year between 700 and 900. It doesn't seem to be big development in military uh, technology or techniques. The armies all fight exactly the same in 600 as they do in 900. And there's no real mosaic art in Europe from that whole time, at least still exists. Well, I mean, if this is all true, this is completely uh, insane. I mean, that's 300 to 500 years of missing building anything, like developing anything in the military. That's pretty crazy, considering what has happened since the year 1900, even in our recent history. Like, Wi-Fi didn't exist, I don't know, a handful of decades ago. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, progress moves fast exactly. so where was the progress yeah that's a long time let me slap you with this carrie there's no when you look at your old european towns and cities mm-hmm. the ones that have been there for hundreds of years right like lisbon portugal yes you know how many old buildings there are in that city many <laughs> many of them are from the late middle ages yeah 1100 1200 None of them are from the early Middle Ages, except maybe a church or two. Um, You don't really see civic buildings at all before about 900 AD. The only surviving buildings from before that time are churches. So is is he positing that they just weren't built before 900-ish? He's positing that it's bizarre that 300 years of supposed international trade and travel and cultural... uh, back and forth and the building of empires all this happened without civic buildings or marketplaces being built in any permanent way okay so interesting right Mm -hmm. Uh, he also mentions that stratigraphies stratigraphies i don't know the study of layers of old towns you know Mm -hmm. you hear about this with the the excavation of alexandria which is a fascinating thing because that's a city just built on a city on a city on a city Mm -hmm. Uh, these old old cities have layers to them and the thing about german medieval towns he gives the example of frankfurt here uh, there is a layer of 600 stuff this this is clearly 600 uh, rubble and then there's a layer of 910 a.d rubble Sean, if this is true, this is absolutely wild. He says there is a little bit of trash and rubble scattered around. In there. I just can't imagine that... anything staying the same like that for 300 years or more. Like no one's like, hmm, maybe I'd like a garage over here or something. <laughs> like, I know. What? <laughs> and then let me go the other way with this. Romanesque architecture. Uh, the sort of same arch, same style archways and columns that Pillars, you saw in, yeah. in the Roman Empire. Uh, you see this in newly built buildings, apparently, from 10th century Western Europe. So how long ago could the Roman era really have been from the 10th century, he would argue, if they were still using all the same um, architecture? Meanwhile, uh, some techniques seem to appear early that uh, allegedly weren't invented till later. Uh, As an example, the Palatine Chapel of Aachen, which is um, where where the Holy Roman Empires were coronated for a little while. This is in Constantinople. Um, It was supposedly built around 800, and it has incredibly steep arches that apparently aren't seen. um, Nothing like that is seen in any of the towns in nearby Germany um, until apparently two centuries later is that the earliest like circa date you know cornerstone date on a building near there that has similar architecture so basically the idea is either someone was like man they nailed those arches i'm not going to try that again for 200 years yeah they or give, if there was just missing time they give the example of the Otmersheim church uh circa 1049 which is i believe a commune today but it's an old old octagonal church that looks very similar really looks like it was built based on <laughs> the palatine chapel if you ask me um but Illig's point would be, I'm sorry, this isn't even Illig, Nemitz's point would be, 
if these two buildings were built 200 years apart, why is the architecture so similar? Why has nothing developed or changed over this whole time? That's my question too, Sean. He says they both look similar. Therefore, the old, quote, older one must be an 11th century building, just like the newer one. Hmm. Now, here's the question, Caroline. Who would do all this? Hui bono. That's the... Who benefits? That's the biggest problem with a crazy claim like this, is who would have the motivation? Who would have the means to pull off a, a fake like this? Because it would have to be global in, in every sense of, of writing, you know, any recorded history it would have to be kind of agreed upon by everyone. Like, I guess we're in 927 now. The organization would have to be very powerful, would have to have a wide reach. And why would they do it? Why would they erase that time? Why indeed? And are there any organizations we've mentioned so far that could be far reaching and powerful enough to do it? Maybe organizations like the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. More when we return. Want to treat your pup to something special? When you visit www.barkbox.com slash ain't it scary, you can receive a free month added to your plan when you sign up for a six or 12 month subscription. That's an extra month of two fun toys, two full-size bags of treats, and a tasty chew at no additional cost. Recent box themes have included Home Alone, Liquor Treat, and A Night at the Squeakeasy. Poe loves trying out new toys and treats, and he was psyched to get a Bark Box. Your pup will be too. So sign up at www.barkbox.com slash ain't it scary for a free month added to any six or 12 month subscription. That's barkbox.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y. Give your furry friends something to bark about. Welcome back. When last we left you, I had just blown Carrie's mind. With facts. With the fact <laughs> that we are recording the, this podcast in the year of our Lord, 1724. And for any of our listeners, no, we are not time travelers. Um, apparently, that is just what year it really is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because of the phantom time, the 325 years of phantom time, sorry, 297 years of <laughs> phantom time that were added into our history. I mean, the the evidence that has been presented so far um, was pretty compelling. I can't lie about that. I promised when we came back to tell you who was behind this dastardly deed, this inventing wholesale of 300 years of our history. Tell me who it is. Well, Illig has two suspects that he brings up. One with a clear motivation. I can't imagine what that would be. Well, let me tell you, that's because you don't know about Holy Roman Emperor Otto III. He's not on my top five, no. Otto lived and reigned right around the year 1000. Nice. Very auspicious year to be a Catholic uh, monarch mm -hmm. because of the obsession the church has with millenniums. Sure. Well, Herbert Illig suggests that old Otto, who was... Um, Crowned king of Germany at age three in the year 983. Oh, baby king. He, we love a short king. He At this time, the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire that had been, the Empire of Charlemagne was fractured. And in fact, Rome was kind of its own little city state that was ruling itself. And so that's why Otto's family was the, were the kings of Germany and not the emperors of Rome. Mm-hmm. Well, Otto had had enough of that, so at age 16, he marched on Rome and got the uh, Pope there to, to bow to him and name him emperor, you know. Herbert Earl Illig only has one problem here. He thinks His that, name's Herbert? <laughs> he thinks that Otto did all this, but he did all this in about the year 703 AD. Bit different. But old Otto wanted to firm up his claim on this Holy Roman Empire thing he was trying to pull back together, right? And so in doing that, you're pulling together a couple countries that have different dating systems anyway. You're going to have to tell them what year it is. Um, and so he and his friend, Gerbert de Aurillac. Sorry? 
later changed his name to Pope Sylvester II, so that'll help you. Oh, great. Um, old Otto and old Sylvester figured out a way to justify the uh, discovery that their mathematicians and astronomers made uh, that this was actually a thousand years after the birth of Christ. How lucky! We're living in the millennium! Didn't other people know what year it was? Like, well, that's a big jump. It's not saying, oh, we're kind of, we kind of screwed up. Like we need a couple extra months or even a year. That's 300 years. Yeah. They wouldn't have been counting up from the birth of Christ at this point, though. They were on the Julian calendar. Well, still so. from the Julian calendar, whatever. Right. But that would just make this, you know, the year 25 something at this point. So they go, actually, we're going to start counting up from, G we're not going to use this pagan Roman start date anymore. We're going to use the Jesus era. Churches all over the place have set different calendars throughout time. I was reading a lot about this today. <laughs> there are churches that count up from the beginning of the world. So this is like year 6,000, you know, something. Because they think the world is 6,000 years old. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's silly. <laughs> Every country on Earth kind of agrees to use the, the BCAD dating at this point, but it's not what it always was, you know. Right. So our year zero wasn't their year zero. He was saying, I'll tell you what the year zero is. Also, this is the year 1000. So you're saying back in the day, it was easier, e easier to kind of fudge the details a little bit to get a nice round number in there. Well, I'm also saying that most of the rank and file peasantry who would you know hear about this oh he says it's year it's not year 2563 anymore or whatever it would have been it's the year 1000 they go oh great why well uh, jesus was born a thousand years ago oh, i didn't know that they, they right <laughs> sweet they don't have a calendar on their wall they don't um i mean it is true we kind of have this bizarre thing where we're in bc and then ad how does that make sense why not just make it chronological and total up well, I think we've decided, well, because where do you start? I don't know. Where does the BC start? I don't know. We don't have exact dates for the stuff. You know, when you talk about the building of the Pyramid of Giza, it's like approximately 2500 BC, right? So you go back to where we have a date. I don't know. But it's so hard to count up from there where, I don't know, I think they put the zero at Jesus because it's like a pretty good demarcation point of like, really ain't the very ancient world and then like the the sort of ancient and modern world yeah i guess it's a good demarcation point for like after zero ad we truly do have a lot more documents of, about stuff and mm -hmm. it's easier to date things i don't know i don't know how much of this our listeners will find interesting i, <laughs> I might cut it i don't know <laughs> Since Otto knew it was actually probably about the year 700, which, again, he wouldn't have called 700. He just invented this counting up from the birth of Jesus thing. He would then have had about 300 years of extra history for his chroniclers to fill in. You got to write something in, in those history books to make sure there's accounts of something going on in those years you claim happened. And so those chroniclers wrote about uh, the Carolingian dynasty, a group of Frankish kings... Germanic uh, peoples, uh, rulers of a regional kingdom who rose up to unite the uh, Ro Holy Roman Empire eventually with Charlemagne. Does that sound like a familiar story or, or one that would have resonance for Otto? Certainly Charlemagne, yeah. I mean, he's he's a big guy in history. And he came from, like, again, just a Frankish king, just like Otto was just a German king who uh, united the Roman Empire. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. And so here's Otto. So you're saying that Otto made him up. Made up Charlemagne, <laughs> made up the entire Carolingian dynasty, all to lead up to in this kind of grand epic um, narrative to Otto, the Millennium King. <laughs> and he was just the, pretty sweet the best and proudest boy on that day. Sure. That's Illich's theory about Otto III. Now... To be fair, he doesn't offer up basically any evidence for, for any of that. For the specific Otto stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, did Otto have to, like, do anything related to calendars and stuff? No, he just lived his only crime. <laughs> his only crime! <laughs> as far as I can tell, his only actual crime was living in the year 1000. 1000, okay. And putting down some some uh, revolts pretty brutally, but that's a that's another talk for another time that's what kings do mm -hmm. 
so our other suspect may not have had such a clear motivation, but he certainly had the means. And Illig brought him up, and Nemitz here brings him up, maybe more as just an illustrative example, if you will. The Emperor Constantine VII of Byzantium, who was the ruler of the Byzantine Empire, he lived from 905 to 959 A.D. Illig says that might have been more like 605 to 659. (laughs) Burn. Oh, boy. You see, Constantine organized a complete rewriting of Byzantine history by hand, by monks, starting in 835. Over the course of uh, about two generations, two lifetimes of monks, copied over every text that they could get their hands on that had been written in the old Greek written language, which was called Myascula, mm-hmm. and copied it by hand into the new Greek script, which is called Minuscula. And every original it's work. It's really hard to read. And every, yeah, it's so tiny. <laughs> um, I need to get my cheaters. And every original work was destroyed. That seems like a silly thing to do. It does definitely seem like a silly thing to do. It also seems like a great opportunity to get rid of any history. That's a, uh, They really did that? Yeah. That's so stupid. Well, it was... I, Now I have this copy. I'm going to burn the original? Mm-hmm. Well, because the ori- but I hate men. <laughs> but again, if you're... Men are so stupid. If you're Constantine, maybe a few of the works don't get copied over. Maybe a few of the works have some changes in, you know, transition. Maybe some of the wording gets changed, and maybe we mention how Constantine and his dad were the best. Typical. <laughs> now, again, Illig offers no motivation, particularly, for Constantine adding 300 years of history, like he does with Otto, but uh, at least... This this is a good example of how, um, you know, a ruler with this kind of power could rewrite a whole society's history or, or technically add history. they did, but it, there's no certainty that they changed the years. We don't know what they changed. Um, it, it's worth noting, actually, that even earlier, like in ancient Rome, when ever when things were getting pretty bad around like 150, zero B.C., um, around Caesar's time, frequently, like a new faction would take control in Rome and destroy a bunch of the information and hit texts and history of the previous faction. Horrific. Well, I mean, they burned down the library at Alexandria, mm-hmm. the, the biggest library with all of the the knowledge that we will never know. Yeah, histories written by the victors, because the stuff that the losers wrote is it burned up. History is written by a bunch of jerks, if you ask me. I forgot to mention one last thing. Otto III was a distant cousin of Emperor Constantine the Seventh on his mother's side. I mean, yeah, all of them are <laughs> messing around with each other. Coincidence? Probably. <laughs> They're all interbred. <laughs> all right. Here's the thing, Carrie. This is all obviously bullshit. <laughs> Well, you, no, you gave me some really compelling points. Tell me about the, the layers of the cities and things like that. Why is there no changes in building for 300 years? Why is there no changes in the military? That has to have some explanation. The amazing thing about all of that stuff is that it's it's pretty close to true, as Illig says. I mean... So, so that's crazy. It is. and And the amazing thing is that the overwhelming historical evidence suggests and the overwhelming um, kind of consensus among historians is that the years from 600 to 900 were just pretty boring. I No, I don't buy that. What about the years 1500 to 1700? That's a long time ago, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of things changed over that time. And it wasn't even in terms of like digital technology or the crazy stuff that's happened just in the last hundred years. I don't understand how you build an arch in whatever year and then you don't do it again for 200 years because you're like, meh, who cares? After the Western Roman Empire finally fell. Which was in... Yeah, there's a lot of dates you could give the fall of the Western Roman Empire, but it uh, started happening around 400 and continued to to about maybe 500 at the latest. Mm -hmm. Uh, By that time, everything that was 
the Western Roman Empire had become smaller, kind of fractured kingdoms fighting amongst themselves. That's not how history gets made. 300 years, Sean, 300 years where they're not building anything? In Western Europe. Yeah, that's bonkers to me. Mm hmm. But meanwhile. Doesn't a house burn down? You don't build a new one? Mm hmm. But meanwhile, in England, the Anglo Saxons were um, doing their thing. Vikings were raiding, and Anglo Saxon kings were ruling. And, uh, well, they didn't leave a whole lot of interesting architecture behind. They did write about what they were doing quite a bit. So we, the written record is pretty extensive there. Um, we have lots of arc artifacts from the Viking conquests and raids, which happened exclusively during this time. So we do have archaeological items from this time. Yeah, that's the problem with Herbert Illig is he just wasn't interested in anything outside of basically Germany and the Western Roman Empire. Are there any buildings from this time? From like year 700? Well, I gave you an example of a church from the year that's dated to 800. Right. That falls within his phantom time. He just says that those are lies. He says that these are obviously from no. a different year. Okay. Um, the Byzantine Empire has writing and artifacts and buildings at this time. There, are, That's over, you know, kind of Eastern Europe, Turkey area. Um, Muhammad lives during this time. Um, he's kind of an important figure whose life's pretty well documented. Yeah. Um, obviously, after his uh, death... Islam spreads um, and even gets as far as like the Iberian Peninsula before 900. So that's 300 years of history. I mean, that definitely happened. <laughs> so could that be another motivation for them to want to kind of erase that history? Uh, it uh, could... Losing power uh, for... in the Catholic Church mm. due to Islam? I don't think so. I think the Catholic Church's response to that was just doing the Crusades. Yeah. Which wasn't great. No, not not great. Um, and lest we forget. Now, oh, also, the classical Maya, actually, were really kicking during this time as well. And we have some of those structures. Yes, we have their, we have their uh, buildings. We also have, um, you know, we don't have writings. We have lots of buildings and artifacts that have been reliably dated. Again, talking about radiocarbon and stuff, but uh, uh, the Mayans are very well documented. And um, maybe most of all, the Tang Dynasty was in full swing in China. And this was kind of an explosion of culture and technology and math that, um, you know, probably still has impacts on the world today and uh, those and was there building in china between 600 and 900 that can be documented there was okay so it's not everywhere it's just in germany they weren't doing this just in germany interesting that's the problem with herbert like <laughs> yeah big problem for sure and just to put the final nail in the coffin because you could also argue that it's actually really hard to find common dates for, say, the Tang Dynasty and Charlemagne. Mm -hmm. Because, remember, in the year 800 or 900, those places wouldn't have called it the same year. Right. Therefore, the only way you can date them together is by counting back from a year after the Gregorian calendar was introduced. And adopted in both places, which means you're right. You're going. You're falling for their scam again, Carrie. <laughs> you're falling for their scam again. Darn. But here's the final problem, the final nail in the coffin for Mister Illig. Astronomy doesn't lie. Now we're talking astronomy, not astrology. Astrology is exclusively <laughs> lies. <laughs> okay. You can, with a, an incredible degree of accuracy, just with math, predict when and where solar eclipses will be seen. That's why we hear about them before they happen. It's like, there will be a solar eclipse tomorrow. And It'll they're be on the East Coast. And, and yeah. they're, they're never wrong, are they, Carrie? Not usually, no. It's never. I've never seen it happen. I've seen my be. own president stare directly at an eclipse. I know it. God, I've never been prouder. <laughs> Did you know that you can also, this also works going backwards? Scientists can t and mathematicians, astronomers can tell you when solar eclipses did happen. Right, and I'm sure there's a very complicated formula for it, and I would never have the patience to do it, but I believe you. They know for a fact, for example, that there was a solar eclipse in 59 AD, 
And that solar eclipse was described by Pliny the Elder, the historian. Mm. They also know for a fact that the solar... <laughs> and he wrote, ah, the world is ending! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> They also know that the, yeah, I mean, probably, probably, no, Pliny was a smarter guy than that. Um, and by that time... How terrifying would that be, though? Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure. <laughs> at, and at that time, things like astrono astronomical phenomenon were definitely seen as omens. Sure. Um, Photius I of Constantinople, who was the ecumenical patriarch in 418 AD, uh, that's kind of the Pope of the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. Eastern Orthodox. He also described a solar eclipse that scientists can confirm happened in 418 AD. And finally, um, Halley's Comet passed particularly close to the Earth in 1066. Math will tell you that. Uh, what but none of these are during the 600 to 900 period. No, but the important point here is that... Oh, is that it's not off. The written account matches the science and math. The, the written account matches the math. With the 325 years in there. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Halley's Comet, 1066. Actually, um, math, math will tell you that um, Halley's Comet should have passed very close to Earth, about 0.1 astronomical unit away in uh, 1066. And, in fact, if you read almost anyone's writings from that year apparently they reference the ah the world is ending <laughs> giant fiery orb in the sky that they saw as an omen for william the conqueror's defeat of harold ii at the battle of hastings um it's actually probably what george r, r. martin based the uh, meteor in game yeah, of thrones on the the red star or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. god remember when it was good <laughs> oh happy days <laughs> happy happy days someday george will write another book yeah someday and that's it with that final nail there. I leave you. Um, I leave you the Phantom Empty Dark Age and Hollow. Yeah, there's. Um, I think it's such a fun idea, and it's not as if. But yeah, this was something that I had never heard of before until I had listened to just this random podcast about it, and I think this is where you heard it for the first time, just mm -hmm. um, spoken about. Yep, what, and what I was, was. What was that podcast called? I think it's called Conspiracy Theories. Thank you. Just want to give them a plug. Yeah. Um, they're very informational. They just go over, you know, the same kind of stuff that you did without uh, as much banter, I guess. Um, but I had never heard anything about this before. And it seemed really fascinating. And there are really compelling things about it. I mean, it still seems pretty weird to me that you just wouldn't build anything in certain areas, obviously, you're doing that in in Asia and different places, but you're not you're just not going to build anything for 300 years in different Western places, Germany. Like that's nuts. That's yeah. nuts to me, um, and hard to believe. But, but but things were being built other places. It's just Europe, really. I mean, that's hard for me to believe too. But of course, that's probably just like <laughs> just my privilege of of thinking that. You know, my ancestors, Europeans, are smart and, you know, they have modern ideas and things like that. And when in reality, they're probably just being conquered for, by the Vikings for like hundreds of years. Human beings seem to only really get things done when they're organized in a big way. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you look at history, that only usually, I'm not arguing for. <laughs> dictators here but when you see people a strong leadership when you see people highly organized under st a strong government system of some kind we see a society rise that's when stuff happens so you had the roman empire basically control everything that they knew of europe <laughs> um and and the um persians re really uh also and and it, I, you know whatever Euro european history is all about the roman empire taking all of this stuff that was just tribes and stuff having having a good time doing <laughs> doing their thing none of these you, these tribes probably uh, didn't want to be taken over by the romans they certainly probably didn't probably not no but after they were slaughtered by them their children 
had the benefits of roads and aqueducts and city planners and uh, farming that gave them more time to uh, spend their day doing things other than starving. And um, I don't know, when you have the, the, the apparatus of infrastructure, infrastructure in a society and top down rule, it makes it easier for people to create great art. It makes it greater for easier for people to have the money to build buildings. I, I totally, I totally get it. Um, but it, yeah, it always seemed weird to me that in these dark ages, as they're called, like just nothing happened. Like no ruler figured it out in these areas, at least. Um, they're, they're so, like I said, the word is compelling. It's compelling. Is it true? Scientifically, it doesn't appear like it could be true when you talk about the the solar eclipses and everything working within the framework of time as we know it now um but you know it's interesting i love it because i think i've i've pinpointed what i love about this theory it really shines a magnifying glass for you on the fact that time is a construct that we made up Mm -hmm. and kept making up and adding days and taking away days i'm sure it'll before humans are done on the earth i'm sure there'll be some other adjustment to the calendar yeah maybe they'll be able to figure out what day the world was created and how many days it's been oh man and then, and then yeah that's when you do a uh, a global era calendar mm -hmm. That's what they that's what they uh, call it creation era calendars. Yeah, right? we're this on day five billion and two. Yeah, so great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice, nice round, so soft numbers to work with. Mm -hmm. um, Easy to write. But just as an interesting, this was like a one one last little nugget for you here. Just as an interesting uh, side note with time being man made, when they were adopting the Gregorian calendar, uh, Thursday, October fourth, fifteen eighty two was the day that the change went into effect, and then they fixed the 10-day drift that had occurred. So Thursday, October 4th, 1582, was followed by Friday, October 15th, 1582. <laughs> Listen, October's a spooky month, man. Things are things are weird. You never know what day it is. So there are not 300 extra years in history, but there are 10 missing days there. There was no such thing as October 5th through 14th of the year 1582. That's wild. Time, Carrie. It keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Lots of things are a struggle right now. School, work, even something as simple as going to the grocery store. It could feel overwhelming. But one thing that shouldn't be overwhelming is accessing mental and emotional care. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is the leader in online counseling with over 4,000 licensed counselors on the site and over 500,000 people who have gotten counseling to date. The mission of BetterHelp is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient so anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. I've been using BetterHelp for the better part of this year, and honestly, I don't know how I would have gotten through 2020 without it. And, of course, Sean and Poe. When I need to talk to my counselor, I can just text her and I can schedule chats, phone calls, or video calls for longer sessions. This means I have flexibility to set a session during the week, or during busy weeks, I can just shoot her a message here and there when I have time. Take control of your mental and emotional well-being. BetterHelp is a great place to start. For 10% off your first month's subscription of BetterHelp, go to our podcast link at www.betterhelp.com slash ain't it scary and see how good it can feel to push past the struggle and find hope in a new day. That's www.betterhelp.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y for 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. Get professional counseling anytime, anywhere, because you deserve to be happy. It's time for me and my boo. <laughs> These are the chains I forged in life. <laughs> You're so stupid. An online instrument marketplace uh, called Reverb.com. Oh. 
I've been getting ads for Reverb.com recently. B- banjo YouTube brought me to Weird Instruments YouTube. Yeah, so that's where I bought your banjo. <laughs> oh. Uh, our friend Kyle, who composes the music for this show, uh, pointed me toward Reverb.com. It is an, it's a legit site. They're not a sponsor of ours. They're not no. a sponsor of ours. But, uh, they are a good place to buy um, secondhand, usually secondhand instruments. Uh, and new. But in this case, it's secondhand. My banjo? It looks brand no, new. No. Just wait. On Reverb.com, an anonymous seller out of the American Vintage and Boutique Music Emporium in Ohio has listed an acoustic guitar for sale, which they claim is possessed by the spirit of its previous owner. And Gary. the listing is titled Haunted Paranormal Ghost Guitar. How much does it cost? Did they already sell it? Can we get it? Here, Here's more information, Sean. Birthday wish. <laughs> In the listing, the current owner explains the instrument originally belonged to a kid that lived on my street when I was growing up. And that he was rumored to be into devil worship, seances, Aleister Crowley, black magic, and other dark endeavors of the spirit world. The seller goes on to claim that this kid, who was purportedly born in June of 1966, died <laughs> Sure, died at the young age of 13 on Halloween 1979 under mysterious circumstances and was allegedly found electrocuted with the acoustic guitar atop his body. So that didn't electrocute him. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> The seller claims that they acquired the guitar from the kid's mother, and since that time, strange activity has occurred in their home. Quote, Since 1979? It's foggy. Quote, I've heard the strings discordantly ring out despite no one being near the guitar, and that on three occasions, the instrument was placed in a closet only to later be found sitting on the seller's bed. The final straw was apparently an incident in which the object floated out of a trash can where it had been somberly placed. (laughs) (laughs) The Charlie Brown music. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's like a burial at sea. The seller is looking for $666 shipping $66.60. From anyone who is interested in buying the haunted guitar, which otherwise is listed in poor as is condition. As of our recording, the guitar is still available, and if you're feeling frugal, the seller is open to offers. <laughs> I, I'm not giving him more than six bucks and sixty cents on the shipping. That's crazy. Yep, sixty six sixty. Six hundred and sixty six dollars. So when you add that up, it's not anything spooky, but you know, it's fun. That's a reverb listing, if ever I heard one. I <laughs> I saw one the other day that someone had taken a Darth Vader um, action figure box from the 80s that looked like Darth Vader's head and had made that into a guitar. That's fun. Yeah, it didn't seem like it sounded very good, but it was... Probably not. ...a working electric guitar that had a, <laughs> a humbucker just right in the middle of Darth Vader's face. Ah, oh, the old humbucker. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain'titscary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Yeah, Patreon's super fun. You get to vote on episode topics, uh, chat with us in our Discord server, get access to mini-sodes and a bunch of other uh, great content we're getting up there. And uh, our higher tier patrons get to hear their names read right here on this very show, like Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, and Robin McCabe, my mom. (laughs) thanks to all of our patrons we appreciate you so much and we love you deeply see you next thursday show created by sean and carrie mccabe music by kyle ryan if you like our theme song and i i know you do and (laughs) and all of our music kyle has a youtube channel called music is a verb it's super cool and he does super cool uh, music related content he's incredibly talented check it out this has been a production of long boy media (laughs) 